Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, I'd like to call to order the February 18th, 2016 meeting of the City of Bellingham and Planning Commission. Uh, at this point, before we start, I'd like everybody to silence electronic devices. So if you have a cell phone or a laptop you're working on or anything, please put it on silent for us. Thank you. Um, Heather's gonna call the roll. Phyllis McKee? Here. Tom Grinstead? Here. Oli Taishi? Here. Steve Crooks? Here. Lisa Anderson? Here. Jeff Brown? Here. Thank you. And so some of you may have noticed that we had a new name on that roll call. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Lisa Anderson to the Planning Commission. She's our new member. And um, Lisa, do you want to just briefly say something about yourself? So introduce yourself. Hi. I'm really happy to be um, serving along with the fellow uh, Planning Commission. I've lived in Bellingham for over 20 years and have been very involved with my neighborhood board. I live in the York area. But beyond that, I um, work at the community college, um, avid gardener, and have been very interested in the development of Bellingham and its future. So I'm really proud that I have the opportunity to serve Bellingham in this capacity. Thank you, and we're excited to have her. Um, so we have two sets of minutes we need to approve. Uh, they've been distributed to everybody. Um, I'm assuming everyone's read them, so we can just do an approval uh, in mass with a head nod unless anyone has any uh, objection or comment. Okay, so the, the uh, past two meetings minutes are approved. That's January 21st and February 4th. Okay, so before we start our work session tonight, which is gonna be about the land use and housing chapters of the Bellingham Comprehensive Plan, uh, we're gonna open uh, the meeting up to public comment. So there's gonna be a brief public comment period. This is where you can talk about anything you want unrelated to tonight's topic. So tonight's topic is the comp plan, land use and housing chapters. If you wanna speak about anything else, uh, now's your chance to come down and speak and you can speak for up to three minutes. And if you do speak, just make sure you state your name and address for the record. So is there anyone who'd like to comment on anything other than tonight's work session topic? Now's your chance. Okay, thank you. So we will close our public comment period. And with that, I think we can move into our work session. So the past uh, two work sessions that we've had have been on the land use chapter and then the housing chapter. And the Planning Commission requested that the, these two chapters be brought back together because there's a lot of correlation and interrelation between the two. Uh, so this is our third work session combining these two topics. And um, I think we'll, are you, do you guys have a presentation or introduction? Greg? We're, we're open to however you would like to proceed, Mr. Chairman. We um, did prepare the comment tracker mm -hmm. information for you, and we can go through that if you like um, and respond to the Commission's comments. Um, that might be a good way to start, but we're open to however you would like to proceed this evening. Okay. Um, and Jeff, just for your benefit, because, um, and to a certain degree, Lisa as well, who w wasn't here. Garrett asked a question, a kind of procedural question, I think at the last meeting about um, how we're moving through all these chapters and, and then, you know, making, he wanted to make a recommendation kind of. And so this is just a continuation of our discussion. What staff basically told us was you don't have to make any recommendations now. They're just taking notes on what our thoughts are. Is that correct? And then you're gonna bring all that back to us at the end in kind of a comprehensive, like these are all the changes from all the chapters that you recommended at, at the end for our public hearing. So I say that just so everybody knows as a continuation of the past two weeks, there's no pressure to like get exact language out tonight on specific topics. We can just kind of talk about it. Have a, We've had a really good discussion the past two meetings and then hopefully staff's incorporating all that. You know, a lot of what we talked about is obviously in the, in the tracker. So I'm assuming this will just kind of continue, the tracker will continue through all these chapters as we, as we move along. Um, we've allowed public comment, and I think we should allow public comment tonight. Um, and it makes sense, if there's no presentation, it, I guess it makes sense to just take that public comment first, unless anyone on the commission thinks we should, or has maybe any specific questions they wanna ask the staff before we get into it. And if not, I think we should just take our public comment. So um, we're gonna give the public an opportunity to comment on the land use and housing chapters on the topic of tonight's meeting. Um, no one signed up, but I do not believe that means that no one wants to speak. 
So if anyone would like to speak, uh, please come up to the podium, name and address, and we'll give you three minutes to speak about uh, these two chapters. And um, if there's a line, just please line up against the side. So is there anyone who'd like to speak? Clayton? Hello, uh, my name is Clayton Petrie. I live in the Birchwood neighborhood. And I, I just had a couple things that I, I wanted to talk about tonight. <clears throat> the first one is that the uh, County Council had a Committee of the Whole meeting and uh, they voted on the Bellingham proposal and uh, they decided to increase the um, population allocation slightly to uh, adjust to be within 5% of the the land capacity analysis. Um, and I, so I contacted the council office because I wasn't exactly sure what the final motion was. And uh, the final motion was to keep the UGA uh, exactly how it is now. And there was no discussion of adding uh, the Northern Reserve that you guys had recommended as UGA or removing the uh, U Street UGA Reserve. So, um, they're bumping up the population a little bit, keeping the UGA and the UGA reserve as is. Um, I thought you'd might like to know that. Um, and so that kind of takes me into uh, the land use and housing chapters. You guys really wanted to have something called a trigger point. I think Jeff came up with that term for when you would add a reserve or a UGA area. And I, I don't see any discussion of that. Um, and I, I, I just think you should figure out what that trigger point would be when you ask for this reserve area to be UGA. You know, is it when, I mean, if Bellingham's still, you know, the worst in affordability in three years, should, should, do you look at it then? You know, how do you do that? And uh, I just think it's important to, to have that in your comprehensive planning. You know, you, you, basically Bellingham asked for two reserves, they're getting one. And uh, it's, it's, I just don't see where your trigger point language would be other than, you know, one of these two chapters. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, your vacancy rate. Um, there's a little bit of talk about it, and I did mention this before, but uh, you really want to discuss how how you track this vacancy rate. It's probably one of the most important parts of uh, affordability. You know, the, the report I gave you from the Department of Commerce talks about how ours is way too low and that's part of, a big part of the reason why our rents are sky high, you know, the least affordable for, uh, I think it's four person, three bedroom apartments and one person, you know, single person apartments. About 30 seconds, uh, Clayton. So, I think you should just talk about the vacancy rate a little bit more. Um, you know, the land capacity analysis does not account for um, your existing problem with vacancy. Uh, there's thousands of units that you would have to build to get out of that problem, aside from the land, the stuff in the land capacity. Uh, so I, hopefully that's, those are helpful comments for, for making some changes, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Darcy Jones with Jones Engineers. Um, first, I wanted to ask on the comment tracker, um, what's, what exact comments are included and what are not included? Um, are these just verbal comments made at specific meetings? Or if you could help us understand what is in these, what the criteria is to be on this list. Second of all, um, I, I really hope that ultimately the Planning Commission can ask your council to reconsider their population allocation and, and UGA um, recommendation that was made last December, I guess. Um, the, um, you're going to get into your capital facilities planning and you're going to find there's a lot of capital facilities that aren't built, that need to be built. And most of those were defined as existing deficiencies. Um, and those existing deficiencies were assigned to 
particular UGA areas, like the South U Street and the Kaitek, South Kaitek. Yet those facilities must be built in order for the density to occur, which is being credited in the land capacity right now, which allows the city to come to the conclusion that they have adequate land. Yet those facilities are not in place, and they're actually being tagged on to Kaitek and U Street, for example. Yet without recommending Kaitek and U Street to be in the UGA to help construct those, it seems uh, it, it, it's inconsistent to then take credit for the density that relies on those facilities, both in hundreds of acres of employment land and hundreds of acres of residential land. And I'm not exaggerating. I've sent in written comment to this, and I copied this the Planning Commission. I don't see it on the comment trackers, but it's a memo I wrote and uh, just a few weeks ago, a week and a half. And I think that's an important element, you know, and also the fiscal models that were prepared to evaluate the UG areas are in error. There was tens of millions of dollars assigned incorrectly to, for example, the South Kaitek was assigned over $10 million of water improvements that would necessarily be assigned to the King Mountain area just by the virtue of the elevations that the water tank and the pump stations serve. For example, it's over $10 million that was- 30 seconds. So I really think you really need to look at this. I know you've had discussions and I know we're supposed to be moving on, but you're gonna be moving into capital facilities and I don't know that you can intellectually justify assigning uh, accepting a, a land capacity and, and saying that we have capacity without these capital facilities, and on the other hand, saying we can't build them without, you know, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Darcy. Yes, uh, my name is Ann Mackey, and I live in the York neighborhood, and I'd like to echo what Darcy said about, please explain to us how comments can end up in the comment tracker because I was here at your last meeting and spoke and made comments and those comments are not captured here in the documents. So if we need to submit them in writing, um, I'd like to know that because I'm happy to, to do that every time. Um, this new land use chapter and the revised housing chapter have a lot of positive elements that I'm really excited to see and I think that folks are going to want to support those. Um, in, of interest to me is, uh, let's see, it's page 19. Um, which, which packet? It's the land use chapter. So it would be the packet that came out this week for this meeting because the two chapters are combined. Mm -hmm. Policy uh, LU63 to develop innovative techniques to reach out to underserved populations and those typically not involved in planning efforts. You know, we have a, a very scarce participation here tonight, and um, I was at a very well-attended Mayor's Neighborhood Commission last night, and the night before, I was at a packed house in the library for a viewing of the local film about homelessness in Bellingham. So I know there's a lot of community interest, and the question for you as a planning commission and the planning staff is how to engage the community on these very important topics as we go through it in the next few weeks. Um, another uh, thing that I'm glad to see is uh, a section that's dedicated to looking at the role of the university and the question of student housing. Um, historic preservation is called out in a very positive and um, uh, you know, good way. And of course, the, the sections on reducing homelessness in our community. On the issue of ADUs, I spoke to that last week, and right now the rule is, is that accessory dwelling units in uh, single family neighborhoods must have owner occupancy in one of the units. And I wanna emphasize that, that it should be continued. And I have real concerns about where, when, and how detached ADUs might apply in a single family neighborhood. I think we don't have uh, an accurate inventory of what already exists in the city. 
Um, the speaker from Seahome last week said, I think they're listed as has, having two, and they actually have closer to 25. Um, the About other, 30 seconds. Okay, the other night at City Council, uh, Greg Winter, who's the director at the Opportunity Council, reported that Bellingham has the least affordable rental market in the state when you compare income to rental cost, and that's a report from the Department of Commerce. And I think what's happened to a lot of our affordable rental single, single family homes, they've been turned into illegal rooming houses for the college population. The rents have been jacked way up. Working families simply cannot afford those rents, and now they are forced out of our neighborhoods or into um, apartments that aren't always appropriate for families with kids. So we really have to look at how did this happen? How did we lose our affordable rental single family home housing stock in this city? What is the answer to that question? Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Linda Twitchell, Building Industry Association. I'll try not to repeat comments from, Jeff didn't hear them, but I'm sure he read all about it um, <laughs> from a week ago. Um, on the, the housing issue about rents, t interesting, and our observations on that is we're back to the issue of scarcity of land. We have a very tight market for real estate, and the tight market for real estate drives up the rate of rentals. Um, and you guys know that in city council. I wish they would listen, but there we are. Um, on the land use chapter, um, one quick thing here on page 21, we're talking about healthy food. As you all know, I had cancer last year, was appearing here bald for a long time. The list of healthy foods I got from the local cancer center, uh, top of the list, the, the least likely but still on the list are chocolate and red wine. So let's define healthy foods if we're gonna get into that. It, just a word of caution there. Um, on page 28, there's a map of uh, the city of Bellingham developable land. I would love to see this map with an overlay of critical areas so that we can see how much of the developable land is actually something that people with, for instance, median income might be able to afford. For those who are not aware, um, we have been told many times by the planning department that the developable land that the city has left is largely impacted by wetlands, slopes, critical areas, which makes it expensive and difficult to build on. Okay, one other thought I wanted to leave you with, um, and this comes from a conversation we were, some of us were having with the mayor yesterday. On page 20, I was reading policy LU65 is talking about encouraging design flexibility and it says e.g. clustering and low impact development. Something we were discussing the other day that might be appropriate for consideration now is the idea of what was described to me as lot averaging where you have an area where underlying zoning, for instance, or maybe even the land capacity analysis suggests that it should support X number of units. Okay, if it's supposed to support X number of units, do we go at it by saying, and now we figure out which can and can't use, or should we say it should support X number of units, and therefore, once we figure in the wetlands and so forth, it's up to the developer to figure out how they can get that number of units on the property. Different way to approach it, but it seems appropriate to consider when we're looking at a comp plan that is based on land capacity analysis that says X is your expected density, our utilities, our infrastructure, our um, uh, capital expenses will be based on that assumption. So perhaps that's an assumption we might wanna use in terms of trying to figure out what densities should be allowed and supported by zoning. About 30 seconds. Thought for the day. Oh, oh I'm done. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Louise Bjornsson. And I'm really concerned, I and mean, I live in Birchwood. I was really concerned about the change that's being proposed to uh, add uh, detached ADUs into single family neighborhoods. I think that would be a huge impact on our single, older single family Sorry. neighborhoods. When I was on the city council, we said yes to the attached ADUs, accessory dwelling units, because they fit in better with a single family neighborhood. It's one 
house per lot. It might be bigger and have more people in it, but it's still one house per lot. It respects the neighborhood character better. It's more environmentally sound because you have shared walls, and it preserves open space for gardens and yards and places for children to play. We also said no to detached ADUs because that's two houses on a lot. That's not single family. No one would expect when you put your life savings into a single family neighborhood, zone single family, then all of a sudden an extra house gets put in right next to your backyard and if you lost your sunshine. It's really a lot more impact on the next door neighbor, especially on a narrow lot. We have more noise, parking, lack of privacy, lack of sunshine, especially on the narrow lots. People from South Hill brought in pictures what happened to their neighborhood in California and a huge impact. So the city council decided that, that time that no, we would not have a detached ADUs, but we'd have only attached and they would have to be owner occupied as the law is right now. Also, um, the, uh, as proposed, the impact would be only in the older neighborhoods that don't have covenants. The newer neighborhoods, as you know, ha have uh, covenants that protect them, so this detached ADUs would not be impacting those neighborhoods. It would just be more the older neighborhoods. We have room for extra density in our downtown and our urban villages, and that's where we decided that the extra density should go. So I hope that's not changed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Thank you. Paul Schistler, I live in, in Bellingham. Um, actually, I graduated from Huxley with a degree in environmental planning and have worked as a professional community development planner for over 30 years here in Bellingham, including working on housing affordability since the mid 1980s. It's been a problem for a long time. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things. First, compliment the city on the draft chapter. There's a lot of excellent goals and uh, policies listed there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend you remove any of them. Um, much of it, you'll note, is carried forward from the last time, and I'll get back to that at the end of my three minutes, I hope. Uh, but what is included is really helpful, and I think it's important to think of this as a reference. The housing chapter will not be updated for eight years, I think it is. So it is a reference. It's good that it includes things like the definition of affordable in terms of income. It's really good that there's so much information about wages and jobs and the wages they provide and the cost of housing here. And not just for ownership, which is I know a big concern for the realtors and others, but over half of this town rents and it probably will increase over time given the trends that we, we know exist. I'd like to uh, uh, make an assertion and then suggest things that could be added to this reference document, the housing chapter. Uh, I don't think it adequately plans for all economic segments of the community. It points out the huge gaps, the gap uh, between wages and the cost of housing or the housing wage gap. And so I would suggest maybe the chapter could be enhanced by adding a little more about the housing wage gap and the definition of a housing wage what wage do you need to rent a two-bedroom apartment in Bellingham, including basic utilities? Just under $40,000, which is about $19 an hour if you work full-time. The average renter makes more like $12 an hour. So the average renter is short, oops, over $7 an hour if they need a two-bedroom apartment and they have only an average renter's wage. So you know that's why people have to have two incomes or two people or more people sharing in order to make homes affordable. So if there was more explanation of that, I'd also like to encourage uh, an uh, explanation of the housing mismatch. There's a huge range of incomes in any community and thank goodness we have that. But the housing doesn't match up with those incomes. In fact, if you look on page 44 of your packet, and I uh, could talk all night, I, I know I only have three seconds. minutes. Well, uh, one out of three households can't afford the home they live in right now, and its trends have gotten worse for the renters and for home ownership. So I, would, I could put these things on a list for later, a section about how the housing market, the private rental market works, 
and why it's not possible for the private rental market to provide homes that are affordable for the wages that people have. It's just, it's not financially viable for the average for-profit company, but so other mission-driven companies have to be involved. There's a few other things that I think would enhance the chapter. I'll provide that to you and, and staff. But I would like to say that one of the reasons we are where we are carrying forward a lot of actions recommended from the last comp plan is because the city isn't putting enough resources into implementing its comprehensive plan. And clearly that's true in the housing chapter. And so I would hope that your recommendations going forward include putting more resources into implementing the comprehensive plan, especially in the housing chapter where you could easily fill a full-time person's work program just focused on housing affordability. Uh, so I think that would be money well spent and I hope that becomes a, something the city administration can implement. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Is there anybody else? Come on down. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to back up, uh, Dick Conaboy, uh, South 46th Street in Samish neighborhood, back up a bit of what Ann said about ADUs. Uh, no, I'm not against ADUs, it's just that we need to find out what we got right now, get the inventory, and we also have to find out what people are charging for these. They're, they're proffered to, to, the, to, to you and to, to the audience here and people at home is affordable housing, but uh, we don't really know that that's so, at least I haven't seen the figures. We have seen the figures from Portland, and I think their average is somewhere around $750. Now this is in Portland, I understand, but that might give you an idea that the landlords there aren't exactly into charity. So I don't know that we're going to see that here, uh, that is uh, charitable rents. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the inevitable uh, stuffing of houses with more than three unrelated people. In 2007, when I got here, I started a blog on this because I, had f I live on a, on a uh, street with uh, 12 single family homes, large ones. And four of those homes were rentals. And in those rentals were f anywhere from five to seven people, including one which almost housed the entire Western freshman football squad. Uh, <clears throat> you imagine what that was like. And I couldn't get anybody to do anything about it. Nobody would enforce the rules. Mayor Asmussen, to whom I spoke many times, said no, he wasn't going to do anything. Dan Pike, when he was running, he said, I'm going to take it to court. Zero, zip. Now we have the same problem in New York neighborhood, building of these mega, mega houses, the megaplexes, trying to stuff seven people in there and just doing it in broad daylight and nothing's happening. So we need to find out what's going on with these homes because we don't know what, the, how can we know what the density is when people are filling these homes with a bunch of, bunch of uh, renters and we don't know how many are in there. Uh, I, I don't know whether the American Community Survey takes, uh, you know, uh, stock of that, whether they know that these, these rentals are being stuffed, but I think that's an important factor. Uh, otherwise, we just don't know what the density of the neighborhood is. And then you're going to tell people we got to stuff more people in the neighborhood? No, that doesn't work. You need to find out what you got there first. And with respect to land, you know, there's a difference between what people are proposing for, for land use and what actually happens. You, I'll take you back to the rezone of uh, the uh, single family property on which the church was on Samish Way. About 30 seconds. Thank you. That was, that was a single family zone uh, area, almost two acres, eight homes under current zone, zoning, and you guys and the council turned it into commercial property for the use of one, one group. And I didn't, see, I didn't hear any of the real estate folks or the builders coming down here and say, why are you doing that to that property? It's for single family homes. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay. 
seeing no one, we will close the public comment period. Thank you all for commenting. And I just want to just, there were comments about um, a, a number of topics that are going to come up later on in this in, through our work session. So I just want to uh, remind everyone that, that, and Paul, for example, who want to provide more feedback, that the record's basically open throughout this entire process. So continue to provide your feedback, and, and we'll ask about this comment tracker so we understand if that feedback needs to be in writing to get in or, or understand that. But, but uh, please continue to provide your comment in writing, and as we have these meetings, we'll have, we'll have public comment at, at each of these work sessions. So thank you. So with that, I think we should start our discussion. There's no, uh, no real staff presentation. I'm sure you're here to help us work through it. And uh, we, we haven't really talked about how to tackle this, so I don't know if there's any suggestions from the commission or Greg, what you think might be an efficient way to, to go through this. We, we're happy just to run through, you know, the Planning Commission's comments. Um, if is, you'd like. Is that? There's not a lot of them. And also, I mean, the comment tracker typically, I mean, we separated them out. One is particular to what the Planning Commission has been talking about, and the other one is particular to public comments. And typically, comment trackers that we use are related to written, written comments, comment, let, yeah. letters or emails. But Greg and I were just talking, and we can certainly add the comments we've been receiving at the meetings, a lot of them are of the similar type of sure. nature, and so you're going to see a lot of C comment above <laughs> I think for a response, but we can add them. We're fine with that. Well, we're listening to these comments, and I know you guys are too, and maybe taking notes when people are speaking. I don't think that, I personally don't think that the expectation should be that staff should be required to document each individual oral comment that's made. That's just, that's just my opinion. That if you, as you hear things and you fit them in, but I feel like it's it's probably more appropriate for comments from if there's specific comments that that need to go in here that the public submit them in writing. It's just easier for us to track looking backwards. We have that written record to to reflect on, and we could all watch the videos. But I just think that that's a I don't know. If you're saying that you have the time to do that, I just don't want to put an unnecessary time burden on on staff for that. It's just my opinion. We would do it if you wanted us to. I don't know. What does the rest <laughs> of the Planning Commission have comments on that, Lisa? Can I just ask a quick question? I notice in the minutes there's a um, summary of the speakers and what they said at the podium, True. but it's not verbatim. So I don't know if we could actually just copy and paste that in the comment tracker because it's not a word for word, and if it would be a situation that if something wasn't paraphrased correctly, someone could come back. Um, could that be used? That way you're not having to go through and, mm. and typeset word for word? Well, I mean, that's what we do in the comment tracker. We just summarize. I mean, if okay. you look, we're just yeah. taking the letters and emails and just pulling out the key points and responding to the okay. key points. So that's, that's what we do anyway. That's my concern, Be though, is that you might get people feeling like they're being mystery. Oh, if, that's, if, yeah. You know, if you start, if you start like, translating minutes. oral commentary, so, but, people are going to go, I didn't say that at the meeting, and then we're all going to be going back watching video. Whereas when it's in writing, it's easier for you to pull it out and, and give it to us. I, that's just thinking, but but I don't know. Anybody else? Phyllis? I would just like to say that in, in reading through this several times, I find that there's a lot of uh, statements that have s such generalities in them, I'm having difficulty visualizing how that would be brought about. And I don't know, I, I think it would make for a cumbersome uh, document to have everything with all sorts of examples and so on right with it. But if there's some way of having a, a, um, an appendix that might say, I'm just picking this out of the, uh, you know, uh, land use 11 and um, pick something out of here and then have back there a little bit more of a descriptor because I, you know, we come up with the words, and even if we might agree what it all means, somebody four and five and six years from now is going to be reading that with their own eyes and not necessarily interpreting it the same way. I, I think there's a lot of vague, suggestive language, not suggestive in a lewd way, but <laughs> suggested language uh, here that needs some, a little bit of boundary and, and explanation. Is that making any sense to anybody? It does. I, 
I do think we want to be careful about how much we how much we put into these as well, that, our, I mean, that's my concern do we take some out so that we're not leading people astray or do we add something in so that we're clarifying and that, there's a dilemma there I, I envision this this is just a guy uh, like a helpful tool for us to look back and remember what people said and submitted I mean we all read all of the public comment as it comes in but but this saves us the trouble of maybe taking notes so I don't see this as like a definitive document by any means that reflects oh, no, what we were thinking I was looking at the comp plan Oh, you're looking at the comp plan, not the. Oh no, I wasn't looking. I was. I'm sorry. Jumping over to the okay. comp plan. Okay, let's let's move forward on the comment tracker. I think that the public should put their comments in writing if they want them in the comment tracker. And so we're going to give you the opportunity to participate every single meeting, and we're going to listen to your comments as we always do. And I take notes at least. Uh, and if you have ideas that you want us to evaluate as a part of this whole record, please put them in writing, and we get those. And then they'll be there for uh, posterity very clearly, and we won't have this issue. Um, beyond that, you're talking about the actual chapter itself. I know. I was sort of parenthetical. Sort of a parenthetical statement here about kind of an overarching concern about the entire comp plan. Some of the things leave either vague concepts as to what it is saying, and others would lead, and how are we going to do that? Greg, maybe that's a good question for for you guys. It, the Compliance kind of intended to be that way a little bit, isn't it? Well, it is, and, and Phyllis, it would help maybe if you could give us an example. I, this this is this is the goal and policy document. This isn't necessarily the how we're going to do it. Um, that the the how comes with our implementing regulations and zoning and those things that we use to accomplish the goals and policies that we set out in the plan. So. We want to try and not be, we've tried not to be too specific. Okay. There are still some policies in here. There are some of them are carryovers that are pretty specific, but in general, this is sort of the what we want to do in the future and the how we're going to do it is through those implementing regulations. That, that helps. That help? Thank you. Okay. Steve? You Yeah, I have a specific reference here. Uh, housing chapter, page four, policy H-7, and also cross-referencing that with the Planning Commission tracker. And this uh, talks about uh, permit uh, attached DU, uh, ADUs in single-family and multifamily zones. Consider allowing detached in certain neighborhoods. It's my recollection, and, and we discussed this extensively by this, this uh, panel, that uh, we should not go forward with adding any new detached and single family homes until we get an inventory and understand what's happening in the city. That was my clear recollection of what happened. But yet, that comment is not reflected in the tracker at any place. So that's one of my first observations. My second comment is to the same paragraph that ADUs sh should be considered in single family in certain neighborhoods. Bellingham is unique in that we have 25 very active and unique neighborhoods. Following on uh, Ms. Bjornsson's comments, I feel a little uncomfortable of sitting up here and recommending to the City Council that this panel or City Council, without one person living in, let's say, Birchwood, recommend detached ADUs. I would like to see something integrated into a policy that if a certain neighborhood is identified with very few detached ADUs in a single family neighborhood, that a partnership or consultation should take place with the leadership of that neighborhood. For us or for me to sit here and say, ADUs are going into Birchwood single family homes. 
I, I really, again, I don't feel comfortable saying that, dictating what that neighborhood or recommending what that neighborhood should be doing. So I would like to see a policy recommendation as to those two points reflected in the consolidation in the housing uh, chapter. Yeah. Um, two things. Uh, number one, um, we did hear you. We did hear you say that, Steve. And that's the policy says consider allowing detached ADUs in certain neighborhoods. Not that we will. Um, but we, we will consider it and that will occur when we bring the ADU ordinance forward for your review and for the City Council's review. No one is suggesting at this time that we identify neighborhoods um, where detached ADUs might be appropriate. We'll, we'll, we'll have that discussion when that ordinance comes forward. So the details are yet to be worked out. Um, I don't know if if we're going to allow detached ADUs in, in anywhere where they're not allowed now. We need to go through that process. Um, and you'll have a role in that and we'll certainly listen to the, to the public. We are um, committed to keeping the requirement that they be owner occupied. That's something we've said before. We'll say it now, we'll say it again, we'll say it every time. We're not gonna, we're not gonna propose changing that. Um, so I hope that helps you feel a little better about this uh, policy and we did suggest a change in the comment tracker I think Lisa suggested a change um, that we hoped would address some of the points that came up we actually added to the policy we're suggesting adding to the policy and this is page two of the comment tracker um, owner the, the, the words owner occupied so it says permit owner occupied attached ADUs in single family and multifamily zones and then consider allowing owner-occupied detached ADUs in certain neighborhoods. So that consideration will be what comes next once we're finished with the comp plan. Yeah, I, I'll carry that again. I, I don't want to keep repeating myself. I think part of that consideration should be a partnership of neighborhood leadership and the recommendation of the Planning Commission to City Council. I, I don't think that's really been stressed and I think it's an extremely important part. That's something we could incorporate into the ADU ordinance itself or something? Lisa? You could, yes. So that, um, this policy was one of the questions that I had sent in earlier and I just want to make sure I'm correct on some assumptions I'm making. Um, in the near future, we will be addressing ADUs as a separate area, and then hopefully that's where we're going to formulate what is allowed, like what type of density, what lot size, whether they're attached, detached, all those things will be worked out. Um, so this would not necessarily be the place to put that type of information in. But what I would like is somehow referencing that because I think when you look at one document and then you got a cross reference to something else, um, it can lead someone reading just this to think that, you know, detached is considered. So it would be nice to be able to reference that future document, something like, you know, per, you know as allowed in you know, the ADU ordinance or as stipulated as, so that it is referencing in a way that there's another document. Now we don't have the name of that document perhaps, so I don't know if there would be a general term, but I would like a little clarification that, you know, as it's allowed or pertains to such and such document, if that's possible. Um, because I'm not completely comfortable with the idea of consider allowing um, detached ADUs because I think that is a question whether or not we're going to allow it because that decision hasn't necessarily been made yet because the ADU ordinance hasn't been set because we may decide and City Council may decide not to have um, detached ADUs in single-family neighborhoods so we're referencing something that hasn't been decided yet and that's a concern we can say, um, we can add to that, you know, consider 
et cetera, et cetera, through um, a review of the ADU ordinance with that, something to that effect, because that's what we're doing right now. And we've actually been working on it for the past several months, working with focus groups and neighborhoods. And I think that would be authority. helpful to, yeah. to reference that. Yeah, as long as you can do it without making some specific reference to something that may or may not come come into play I get what you're saying you, you know we don't know what it's gonna look like yet so if it's broad enough to be consistent with whatever we do end up getting right I mean either way it's it's a new ADU ordinance yeah. Jeff so I um, apologize for missing the last meeting I, no I don't know how much was covered I admit I didn't go back and look at the video so <laughs> hopefully I'm not retreading um, but I kind of wanted to step back and ask a more philosophical question. Um, a thread of what um, I've listened to and, and participated with the Planning Commission over the years has been um, the housing market here is broken. We need data-driven decisions. Um, we need analysis of, you know, for example, how much of the land supply that is shown in planning doc documents is actually phantom. What are the barriers to building more housing of different sorts, how can we increase density or what's appropriate to increase density to take the population, uh, how do we get uh, workforce and entry level home ownership opportunities, you know, townhomes, different things that could be con considered infill but are affordable for people to buy. There's a lot of this stuff um, and if we don't address it in the comp plan, when do we address it? When I looked at this, um, I have to say I was a little bit disappointed because I know We've talked about a lot of this, about getting down to the fundamentals of why our market's broken and how we deal with land supply and how we deal with um, making sure that the housing mix matches uh, the demand in a way so we don't have this current situation with absurdly low vacancy rates. And when I start looking through the policies, I end up with, you know, develop, consider developing inclusionary zoning. Well, that's increasing the price of some homes to subsidize other homes. Support and expand low-income housing programs and public funding. Look for more money to channel to other people to kind of artificially reduce the price of, of housing. Uh, support organizations that construct and manage and provide services that are affordable, which means providing more funding for them to do that. Advocate for regional and state initiatives to increase funding for affordable housing. Well, that's looking for more money. And I think my point has been and continues to be what is structurally wrong with our housing market how can we address that? How can we fix it? And is this our opportunity to do that? Um, and I'm not feeling, I'm feeling that so much has gone forward from the last plan in terms of policies and, and vague ideas that the hard politics of sitting down and saying, we have to talk about density, we have to talk about appropriate housing, we need to figure out what's wrong structurally, is kind of going by the wayside. So I don't want to you know, be a fly in the ointment here, but I, I'm just really struggling with that because um, that's why I got on the Planning Commission. I hear that all the time, that's a big problem out there, and I would really like to contribute towards coming up with a plan to solve it, and I'm not getting that feeling here. So that's my philosophical point, and I don't know what we can even do with that, but when I read this, I'm just trying to mesh how you deal with that in a positive way in the comp plan and actually have something solved. <laughs> well, Phyllis? Well, I would like to just echo exactly what Jeff has said. And, and uh, you know, looking at here and seeing uh, some language about everything seems to be artificially addressed. We're going to solve the problem. It's almost like treating the symptoms. And I would love to see a more underlying correct, correction in, in the housing issue if that's possible. But I think we're going about it in a way that might come back to be less than what we're expecting it to be. And it just do, it, it doesn't change the whole amount of money that's spent on housing. It just shuffles it from one population to another. Well, we're happy to take any specific suggestions. At this point, I mean, the documents have been drafted and we just need some specific yeah. changes for policies or language. And that Jeff, could be added. So, so, you know, that was a discussion topic at the last meeting a little bit, and Garrett keyed in on it a little bit, and a number of us did. This, w there was, there was an, I think there was an underlying feeling from a number of commissioners that there w it was lacking some oomph in the section that talks about housing affordability 
and, and that, that being such an overriding issue, and I'm paraphrasing maybe for the whole discussion a little bit, but that there was just something lacking. And I know that we talked about that, and I, I we didn't make any specific recommendations, I think, because we were just gra grappling with the idea. And that doesn't have to happen tonight, but you know, I think that it's worth throwing some ideas out. I tried to come up with a policy about monitoring affordable housing, and I see you guys put it in here, and I, I like butchered it last at the last meeting in terms of trying to convey the idea, I think. But you know, that's what we're talking about here, right? Is how can we get language in there that accomplishes what you're talking about? Actually figuring out what's wrong. Not band-aiding things, but in if that's through policies to talk about monitoring, you know, assessing data, developing new data, I don't know. But I would encourage you, and it doesn't have to be now, but you know, as we go through this to think about that because I brought up a big part of this is jobs and our wages and like one of the public commenters spoke about that gap and we're not going to bring the house rental price down to 12 bucks an hour, but if we can come down a bit and also come up a bit and get people at 14 or 15 bucks an hour, you know, so there's that part of it and that doesn't necessarily fit in the land, I think staff was telling us it doesn't necessarily fit in the housing chapter. And we asked for that one crossover policy, which Does, you guys included. Yeah. So we I mean, asked for a policy fits. yeah, that crosses, that bridges that gap to the, so anyway, I'm saying this was something, don't feel bad bringing it up because it's something that I felt like a lot of people had concerns about and, and we need to develop some language if we want to get it in, into this thing for, for evaluation. Well, I could, as an example, you know, the, there's a section in here that emphasizes the need to retain and rehab and, and manage historic housing. And I remember when we had the conversation about the uh, rezoning, the particular area that was um, east of Forest and south of Ellis and north of Magnolia, I think it was, two, three years ago. You know, it had a lot of um, older fairly run down houses and mixed commercial use. You know, there were small businesses that were in sprinkled in houses and things. And it was a, it was kind of a gateway area to the downtown and, um, you know, it was the, a lot of the housing had exceeded its um, useful life and there, there weren't mansions there or anything. So we had the conversation about what, you know, what's a good use for that area? You know, is that a good use for medium level, you know, two, three story mixed commercial, um, uh, residential units, uh, you know, you could potentially have condos or owner-occupied um, house uh, residences in there. And it all came down to, well, no, these are old houses, and this, this is important, and our, you know, historical houses are something that are, are, are a very important thing in our community. And I would agree with that in many areas, but in there are some areas, we just threw up another barrier to redevelopment to get more density in a place where it could have handled it without impacting historic neighborhoods. And that went out the window. So I'm just very nervous about, you know, we keep adding these things that sound good on the surface, but the structural problem of redeveloping where appropriate, increasing density where appropriate, um, coming up with, you know, infill that actually has more owner-occupied components for smaller residences or different residences, that just keeps getting set aside. And that's my issue, is I'd like to hit that head on. Lisa? So I, I have a quick suggestion. I mean, it would be helpful to know what you think about some of the changes that we've suggested. Do you, I think. Yeah, do you want to r run through those? I and mean, we could probably go on for quite some time kind yeah, of Yeah, I, I mean, I think that would help just as far as um, Okay, and you know, I know Lisa, you like had some specific questions and I want to give you the opportunity to kind of make sure that the ones that you need feedback on that you can ask too. So where that fits in, and for anybody, you know, as we go through these, if it keys into one of your topics, then we can branch off into a discussion of that. Um, but sure, so do you want to just do that then? And we'll kind of... Yeah, so the first one um, on the Planning Commission comment tracker is what we're looking at. For LU10, uh, you wanted us to add, but not limited to. Then the revised policy is continue to implement and seek new innovative tools to achieve a healthy mix of housing that is affordable to a wide range of incomes and then including but not limited to and then the list that way I think it leaves it a little more broad for you does that work yeah I, I don't remember who made that suggestion but um, I think it might have been Garrett I think it might have been Garrett yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, let's, well, let's veto that one we can <laughs> check with him later I guess um, and then LU 23 was the one about 
design standards. He wanted us to add some terms getting at creativity and flexibility. So we're proposing review and update the city's commercial zoning regulations, design standards, and design review process as needed to allow design flexibility and creative address emerging issues and ensure quality development that is compatible with the character of surrounding areas. That was something that I think a couple people commented on throughout both chapters was that reference to quote high quality and what that really meant. Well, I, I, and oh, I think this is a good, you know, this is a better, this is a solution based on some of the comments you received from us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else specifically wants to talk about that. No. We do have a design chapter yeah. coming and then also I went back and looked at the economic development chapter and there was a very similar policy that referenced high quality. That was just approved a few years ago. Yeah. So. Well, the concern that was there, and since you just mentioned design chapters and things like that, the concern was that, that um, I guess when we're looking at design standards, um, that planning staff and, and developers are very cognizant of the impact of that on the cost of a development project, and therefore, again, it all gets back to housing affordability. So. We don't want plywood boxes, but on the other hand, you know, if you're if there are design characteristics that are going to add 10% to the project just because somebody thinks it's a good idea, but it doesn't necessarily do much, that's not such a good thing. So, both here, and I appreciate this. This was what I was looking for. Um, but both here and uh, when you get to the other chapters, again, just always think the cost impacts of things like the, the design standards would be my suggestion. And then the next one is LU45. Um, it's a list of factors that should be considered when determining the size and location of Bellingham's UGA. And um, we just had a long list that weren't necessarily ranked and you wanted us to move uh, varied and affordable housing needs closer to the top, so we did that. I think that was something I com complained about. <laughs> so thank you, Lisa. So I was wondering, um, since this is land use, that um, when we're looking at expanding into the UG UGA, um, there's nothing about manufacturing or light industrial as one of the rankings. And I know housing is a big issue, but so is livable wages, unless I'm missing something there. And I was wondering if this would be an appropriate place to put a bullet point, because um, if we're looking at we're going to move into one particular UGA over another, um, like if, you know, we're going to pick, okay, we're going to expand in this location, if it's possible to take into consideration whether, it allot, whether or not um, manufacturing, light industrial, but, you know, not necessarily a high priority on my end unless we run out of retail space, but whether or not that could be a factor to be looked at. Yeah, we'll look at that, Lisa. I think that's a good addition to add to the list, actually. I think that's a great suggestion. And if we can put it higher on the list, or not at the top, but just not at the very bottom, because I know, again, we're really focusing on housing, but again, we're not going to get people into those houses they can afford unless we get some more um, higher paying jobs. And that's going to be dependent on making sure that we have our industrial and manufacturing jobs. Moving on to page two, the, the next one is uh, regarding the transfer of development rights program. And it was more of a, a question or a comment than a request for a specific policy change. So you can see in our comment that the existing policy that we have in the plan talks about reviewing and updating strategies including TDR. We're not suggesting that an ineffective program <laughs> be continued. So this policy is suggesting that we work with the county um, at looking at some changes that could possibly be made to our current program, but that we keep it in the plan. I have a question. Um, this this comment tracker notes that um, 
the inclusionary zoning and transfer development rights programs are the most effective tools. Um, d is there any, I just don't know a lot about the, the other TDR programs out there. Is there any background information that maybe might let us know why they're being successful in other places and not here? Because my biggest issue is that they're not successful. Well, that's what these links right here, they're highlighted. The so PD they'll have that, they kind of yes, have. Yes, the some PDF event. version, you can click right on the Puget Sound Regional Council's website oh, in, in the, and also the Municipal Research and Services Center. Both of those sites, um, we rely on them quite a bit for information. A lot of local governments do in the state. So um, we just pulled that tidbit straight from the, the PSRC's website. They've done an extensive yeah, study on housing strategies. Okay. So the next one, I'm not sure I, who had this particular question, but it, it's related to the King Mountain. It might have been you, Ali, I think. Yeah. It, whether or not they were developing to maximum or min minimum densities. And Chris Behe did a little looking and said that the one recent post-recession development in that area has developed below the minimum 10 acre, uh, 10, 10 per acre density, which was the developer's choice. At, it, but it's too early to tell what the final mix will be for the future phases. That was, a, um, I think, a question I asked talking about how do we motivate people to get up to the maximum as opposed to setting a range with potentially, this is that TDR issue of are you, are you de-incentivizing maximizing density by creating a low that you get and then you have to kind of pay to, to get up to the high. Um, we haven't talked at all about minimum densities. Is that something that the city has talked about internally in the planning department? I'm curious what you guys think about the idea of a minimum density. We, we have talked about it uh, quite a bit over the years and actually we have a policy in the housing chapter yeah. that says we should consider uh, minimum density requirements for residential zones. Um, it's something that you know the policy direction is there and and something that we should do it, it it's a it's a very complicated issue we've got the king mountain example is a good one um you know, they could build 10 units per acre they chose to build something less than that um and so do we want to force people to that's what you essentially be doing with the minimum density is forcing people to build uh, a certain number of housing units and is that is that what we want to do um you know, if you want to make a strong statement about it in the plan, you could. It just says consider now. Uh, but there are many jurisdictions that use minimum densities. Uh, it's not that uncommon. What, what happens if you don't have the room to fit the density because of crit well, virus setbacks or that's whatever part it might of the be? That's part of the complicating factor, and especially in our the fringe areas of the city where you have critical areas, you have wetlands. Um, many times developers even want to build more units than they can because of the set-asides. Um, we try and uh, account for that by allowing um, cluster subdivisions or the density to transfer to the usable portions of the site. Um, so those, those things help, but um, it, again, our, our density limits in all of our areas are, are generally maximum maximum six units per acre, maximum 10 units per acre. Uh, if someone wants to build less than that, if they feel like that's where the market is, they're, they're free to do so under our current regulations. Does staff have any idea why they chose to do uh, fewer units per acre up there? Um, I believe it was a market decision um, that they made that a uh, certain size house and a certain size lot was was what where the market was and um, so that's what they chose to do um, I, I don't know any more than that Tom. Jeff excuse well, me one, it, oh, sorry is it possible to put this on an overhead so the gallery can see these comments we did make copies for folks. Oh, there might be some copies. that don't have it. Okay. But I'm sorry. We made to... ten copies of each, so at least ten people have them. <laughs> I mean, we we can do that if, if people want to. Go ahead. Who, who would like to do it on the small one? Looks like we need a few people. 
I don't know why they Mine's printed nice and big. I don't know why these are so small. Jeff, well, I sorry. Well, that's interesting. Again, that's uh, that has some implications for our land supply inventory. You know, we've got this magic number. We've got critical areas affecting it, and we've got other situations where you've got a, a you know, this doesn't apply to homeowners. What if a homeowner has a house on three lots and they, they just like their backyard? Well, that's not going to be used. Or so how, I, you know, there's just um, a lot of things that affect what the real land supply is versus what our number is. And I just. Um, Jeff, can, I, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? Our, our land capacity analysis that we worked out with the city and the county accounts for environmental constraints. It accounts for situations where you've got a single house, maybe on a large lot that's not going to subdivide, it's not going to redevelop. So it attempts to account for as many of those special circumstances as we can. It's not just what does the zoning say, okay, that's how many units are going to be there. We try and factor in as many factors as we can, uh, critical areas constraints, infrastructure requirements if new roads are needed. Uh, a certain uh, percentage of the capacity is reduced because not everything's going to develop in the next 20 years. Um, uh, so all of those things are factored in. I don't want people to get the impression that the land capacity analysis doesn't include those things because it does. Okay. Thank you. But I sure. did actually have a question on the on uh, what we were talking about here, and that is when we were talking about the Fairhaven plan. I think when it went to council, there was discussion on either minimum. Minimum developments or minimum heights. Did any of that come to fruition um, for certain areas? I because I think that was actually tackled during that process, and I thought something came out of that. Chris, looks like you want to answer that. Yeah, there were uh, minimum height limits uh, adopted for the commercial core areas uh, to ensure that there is a uh, you know an, an urban presence being built there and not something set back on the lot that's not going to contribute to that that type of an environment. That was also on the waterfront plan. Yes. Right. There's minimum height limits, I remember. So that's a that's a backdoor into requiring density without saying yeah. density. Yeah. Right. I, I, I didn't I missed that policy considering minimum density. I, I like the idea of I don't I don't feel like I want to hash this too much more because I think that where we're going to tackle a lot of this uh, maximizing density issues when we review the subdivision ordinance because there's, that's really what that's about is trying to t get more out of out of lots in an appropriate way. And so I, I think saying consider is okay because we do that subdivision ordinance, we see what happens over the next few years, you know, we see how the King Mountain area develops a little bit and we'll have a better data set to evaluate if a minimum is appropriate. I, I'm a little nervous about going farther personally. But I appreciate you, you commenting on it because it was a question I had. Well, the subdivision ordinance is going to look at um, not only um, clustering but lot averaging yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Linda commented on that, and I wanted to mention that uh, several comments that we heard about the ADUs and things like lot averaging are going to be tackled, much like the issue that you're talking about, Steve, in the actual ordinance, in and uh, not in a policy document like this. <laughs> Looks good. <laughs> Heather, do you think you could focus that? That's terrible. No, it's just the size of the, the text. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I did want to mention that we did post both of these comment trackers on our comp plan update webpage for folks that are viewing at home or viewing later. Okay. Yeah, so and, if, and if you could update them as, as you update us with them, will. that would be important for the public. Yep. So all the draft chapters and the comment trackers will be posted on that web page. So the next comment is, uh, I believe Steve wanted to know the state references for the requirement to try to maintain an open space corridor between urban growth areas. So those are the references listed there. So that, those were your main comments on the land use chapter. And now we'll move into the housing chapter. So the first one was emphasizing owner occupancy for ADU requirement. And we did just discuss that, but, but we did make the change to add the terms owner occupied to policy H7. We also modified the text box regarding ADUs on page four. 
to take out the terms current rules require. So does that adequately address your comments for now? Yeah, there was a little Oh, we were also going to add Lisa's suggestion at the end of that policy referencing the upcoming ADU ordinance update and review. Is there any other comment on this topic? I know this was one that got a lot of discussion. Talk about it now. I think those changes capture a lot of what we what we asked for at the last meeting. The next comment was specific to policy policy H seventeen, which is pertaining to inclusionary zoning, and the commissioners wanted to know of some specific examples of cities in Washington that use inclusionary zoning, and we've listed quite a few there. And once again, if you go to the PDF, you can click on those links, and it'll take you directly to the list of cities, and then it'll take you to the actual ordinance or policy related to inclusionary zoning for each of those cities. So there's cities such as Kenmore, Kirkland, Red, Redmond, Federal Way, Marysville, I don't know how you say that one. <laughs> Polesville, <laughs> Shoreline, <laughs> Snohomish, and Woodenville. Those are just some of the some of the examples that were listed on Puget Sound Regional Council's website and also the MRSC site. Do, do we have any idea whether these things actually work? I mean, there weren't extensive studies accompanying the, the list of cities that have them. You can go into the city websites, I'm sure, and assess that. Jeff? Well, this is neither here nor there, but um, I would point out that if you're looking at inclusionary zoning, you're looking at a 5% increase in an $800,000 unit so that you can provide a 10% decrease in a $200,000 unit, you're in a different market than Bellingham. And I, uh, some of these are my client cities and I, I deal with them and I, um, I see the value of looking at other cities and looking at the ordinances, but I remember the market we're in and I just, I have a lot of reservations about, about pricing workforce housing out of the reach because we're trying to solve a low income affordability housing by increasing the next increment up by increasing the cost of that housing to create that subsidy and therefore we've just shot ourselves in the foot. So I just hope that gets an extraordinarily close look if we actually go down there. Right, and, and I did wanna note that once again, that's a policy that's being carried over and it's a tool in the toolbox and if any sort of ordinance or program were to come about, it would have to go through a rigorous process, public process through the Planning Commission, through the City Council, with neighborhoods, with stakeholders, et cetera. So where are we right now on that? Where, where's the city right now on inclusionary uh, zoning? Do we have anything going on at all? No. Okay, good, thank you. Jeff, any other comments on that? We talked about it a little bit at the last meeting when you weren't here. Garrett talked about it and a few people brought up the issue that you're bringing up, which is does it, what's the net benefit? Is, you know, the broader, broader impact on how, housing affordability citywide. Um, yeah, I'd know. love to see, that, you know, I think if it stays in there and it's considered a tool, I would just, you know, I don't think it's bad from a policy perspective just to say, you know, it will be considered to the extent it, it does not cause you know, it, it does not distort that the housing market at a certain level. I don't know what you'd say. I mean, yeah. there, I'm just concerned that sometimes the best intentions are set up and then all of a sudden you found out this whole mid band of housing just jumped up in price 10 or 15% because you were trying to solve the bottom 20% of the market. And I just don't want to see that happen here without a lot of thought. So I don't know if there's wording that you can have just kind of creates a sandbox for it or maybe I'll play with that. I'll get you some. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> worthwhile, something for you to think of, I mean, if you can, because I like where you're going. Okay, the, the next one, policy H20, 
uh, we were requested to specifically reference underserved populations. So the proposed modification is provide information to residents, including underserved populations, on affordable housing opportunities and first-time home ownership programs. That was something I commented on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That just brings it more consistent with the language in the policy in the land use chapter. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's yep. good. Policy H22, um, monitor housing demand relative to housing types. So we have some proposed change language for that one. It's monitor the city's affordable housing market, including housing demand by housing type, and report on the effectiveness of the city's affordable housing policies. And then just a footnote that the term affordable in this context is affordable housing options across all income levels. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, is that too confusing? <laughs> to, to, I like that you defined it that way because that was something I brought up again at the last meeting about trying to get data on, you know, not, I guess, what the demand is. I was thinking about what the demand is for everybody. And so I, I like I like that you included that, and I think it, it works for me. I don't know if anybody else has comment on that or any, it takes issue with it. Um, Jeff, this was a, I was kind of drill, this is the one I was trying to come up with language on and didn't feel like I got it, but I feel like you did a good job here. It was getting more data on what, what people are actually looking for and what, I was tying it to like job growth, like you know, if, if we're looking for living wage jobs or or better jobs, what are, what are the kind of housing opportunities that we need to provide for those people? Are they all going to want to come here if all we provide them is one certain housing type? So keeping an eye on what people who we want here want, kind of. Yeah, I think the discussion, from what I remember um, before, was you know, there's a it's a very segmented market. Like obviously, you have student housing, um, you have um, if you're talking about multifamily, you've got a lot of different sectors, and one of the things that I'm familiar with is, you know, the, the workforce, say, condo or, or opportunities you have for people in the workforce to get start equity building in a particular type of house that's not a $400,000, $500,000 single family house. And, and that's a shortage we've got that we don't really meet right now. And, and, you know, that's the opportunity people would have to get a foothold in the Bellingham market. You know, they can buy something that's a couple hundred thousand dollars and they can build some equity, then they can build up. We don't have a lot of that. And so that was the idea was to actually start segmenting through and looking at, okay, where are the gaps in the market? You know, is it student housing and what policies do we need for more student housing that's off campus? Is it workforce housing? Is it retiree housing, which is, you know, that's, that's looking at a different segment. So I just want to make sure yeah. we we're really dialing in the mix of housing that we were trying to achieve through density or through zoning changes so it actually met that. And so if this wording does that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to convey was this looking at all segments of the market and and, and what each segment needs. So I, yeah, that's exactly, you just said it better than I did last week, two weeks ago. So I like that change, unless anyone you know, has issues. Which with change? What you well, okay. what you put in? What's in there? Yeah, or you wanted to yeah, change it? H twenty two as written. Okay. Hmm. Bold it. Bold it. Okay. Sorry. Bold it. So the next one is related to the connections between land supply and housing affordability and housing choices. There were some comments that there wasn't enough of a discussion related to the connections, and uh, our response is specific to. The process that we went through to develop the population and employment projections and reviewing the urban growth area boundaries and during that process expanding the UGA for additional single family units was discussed and as noted in the plan there are many factors that must be considered and discussed when determining whether to increase the city's land supply specifically by UGA expansion and some of the, the considerations are listed there. And then we go on to, to note that the Whatcom County Council recently preliminarily adopted the population projection of 31050, which um, can be accommodated within the existing city limits and UGA boundaries without upzones to our existing neighborhoods. And then we also have some references to um, some portions in the housing chapter that talk about these issues. H1 in, in particular states that 
ensure Bellingham has a sufficient quantity and variety of housing types and densities to accommodate projected growth and promote other community goals. And since one of the main goals of the update is really to consolidate information, we didn't feel like the, the section on land capacity and accommodating growth that's in the land use chapter, we didn't feel like that needed to be pulled over to the housing chapter. Folks can go there if they want to read more about it, and they can also actually reference our land capacity analysis summary document. Um, specific to land supply's impact on housing affordability, there are a whole host of, of considerations, once again, that affect housing affordability, and uh, it's not just housing supply. And then at the bottom of that particular staff response, there are some statistics on some of our, our existing developable, developable land and what the, the zone capacity is for single family units, uh, which is 5,667. And it's all listed right there. I just want to discuss that further. Does anybody have any comment on this? This was, yeah. I guess this question would have to, uh, what if? Isn't the, the state legislature contemplating right now free community college in the state of Washington? I believe that's one of the things that's come up. I don't know the probability that it'll, it would ever pass. But how are we as a city prepared if, in fact, the community college decides to go seven days a week because we can get more people in, the state's going to pay for them, 24 hours a day, we'll be just be producing students. How does the city react or how are you prepared to act if something like that went through, because it's going to dump probably a whole lot of new people into a confined area, maybe extending throughout the entire city in transportation, if something like that passed. I don't know. That's a great question, Steve. Right. Just being discussed at the legislature. I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about yeah. the specifics. At this point, um, given that they can't fund K through 12 education, it seems unlikely that community college would suddenly be paid for by the state. But um, we would certainly look at the impacts of it were that to happen. I, I think it would have a significant impact, not just in the north, but throughout the entire city. What if? I won't speak for the community college. I do work there, um, which does give me some information. But again, I will not speak for them because I don't have their plan in front of me. But I do believe that would be um, where it's already previously written, where the city would be um, working with the higher education to identify and address housing issues for their students. Um, and um, I think we'd need to look back and refer to the um, ETC, Wacom's, and Western's, um, I think their institutional plan where they do address expansion. Um, and I think the consideration, the talk has been at the federal level as far as free community colleges, just not at the state, because again, state can't afford to pay for the K through 12. But if it did happen, it could not happen overnight because every institution only has a certain amount of classroom space and functionality with staff to be able to handle an influx. So we would have, I assume, some time um, in order to address that expansion. And I do know the community college holds quite a bit of land out by the Cordata area. And um, they do have, they're contracting with, student, with housing currently for their students and have some resident life. So I think that is on, not necessarily the huge expansion if tuition became free, but as far as um, providing housing I think that's in an overall plan. How quickly it's um, implemented, I could not speak to that. But again, yeah. the importance of us working with the higher education in order to um, address their students, I'm glad that's in the plan because I think that would be an important component to address that concern. 
Thank you. you know, this was a comment that Garrett raised. Um, that this adding language about the impact of land supply, um, and I think I I don't want to speak for him, but this this one strikes me a little bit as well. And I don't think that the suggestion would be that uh, it would that it's that it's housing affordability is dependent solely on land supply. I don't think at any point in our discussion anyone suggested that that housing affordability was dependent solely on land supply. I think all that Garrett was trying to say was that the availability of land has an impact on the affordability of housing. And that's a very broad statement and I think it's, I personally think it's true. It is one factor of many as, as you noted here. Um, but, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that that, you know, that there should be a policy that says th the availability of land supply dictates our housing affordability or anything like that. I would say, I mean, we have a policy that says consider the impacts of transportation costs on housing affordability. I don't think it's all that far outside of the realm of reason to, to have a policy that says consider the availability of land, the, the impact of our land supply on the affordability of our housing. I mean, it, it does have an impact. So saying, hey, think about that. I don't, I don't personally see anything wrong with that. Um, it sounds like you guys don't want to go there maybe with, with this document because this is a pretty robust defense of the status quo um, on, on this particular topic. I, I don't know. No, do you, do you I, feel like there's enough in here that we get that picture? I think we do, but we would put it on you if you want to develop a policy. I, I'm not going to make a recommendation now, but but I, we might want to circle back to this when Garrett's in the room, just because this was something that he particularly brought up. I think is a, is a pretty significant issue for him. Um, like we have lots of time, and nothing has to happen today. So I, I just want to note that because if if I forget later, maybe someone else can remind me when Garrett's in the room. The next question, I believe this was also Garrett's. Um, sh he asked if a third party audit should be conducted on the land capacity analysis. And Chris Behe, who was here for the last uh, round of the LCA, says that a third party analysis was conducted on that one by the Department of Community Trade and Economic Development and that the findings were generally favorable for that methodology. And the most recent LCA is Whatcom County's land capacity analysis. It's the one that all of the cities and the county are using for this process. And that was under the supervision of the countywide growth management oversight committee. So we can bring that back up when Garrett. Yeah, and he probably read this. Okay. So thank you. The next one is add a policy regarding not requiring uh, ground floor commercial space in mixed use buildings in certain instances. So we have a proposed new policy and that would be reevaluate commercial zoning regulations that require development of commercial use with residential development. Consider adding criteria that would allow residential uses to develop independently in certain circumstances. Steve? I like this was that. something that you brought up that I think we all felt really positive about. No, that's, no, that's good. Thank you. Does anybody have a comment on that? Tom? Well, it, it just it follows what's happened in Vancouver. Um, 15 or 20 years ago, they were hot on putting commercial on the ground floor of any new building, and then they went back and looked and a lot of these buildings that were off the arterial a block or two, the main floor, the first floor was entirely vacant except for the lobby for the apartments going upstairs. So they went back and um, actually changed their policy and the regulations so that, um, uh, and I don't know this for sure, but I, I believe they stuck the commercial requirement only on the arterials. Jeff? So my one question about the wording on here is that it kind of opens that door a crack to reevaluating it. And I'm wondering, 
you know, do we want to be a little bit more straightforward and just basically say that uh, those particular policies will be developed um, up front as part of the when the con as part of a direct policy in the comp plan that uh, the commercial development uh, requirements will be reviewed and adapted to case by case or arterial versus non-arterial or you know just basically take that head on instead of just having the door open a crack to look at it later is that should that be more I'd aggressive be in favor of that do you mean actually putting <laughs> criteria in the comp plan no I don't think you'd do the criteria in the comp plan but just a stronger statement that one of the objectives of this plan or one of the one of the policies of this plan will be to go back and review that and actually change that um, to make it adapt to current situations the other thing I'd point out is that that may change over time you know you might have something where you you're requiring right now. I'm thinking of the place by Fred Myers on um, off Lakeway, but there was a you know for five years, six years. There's been an empty ground floor there, but you know if there's a time function on that where you know if if it looks like the market changes over time, you could switch back and forth between residential and commercial to, to meet the market. You know so you wouldn't if you had an empty space that was commercial and didn't make sense, you could shift that over to residential. Like a flex unit. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the solution for that is that just allow that flexibility so over time you can just make sure everything's full and everything's working. My, my question for staff would be where where does that evaluation occur? Is that as, as a review of a zoning uh, ordinance or as part of a code script? How do you envision that that happening? Um, I mean, this does say reevaluate commercial zoning regulations, so it does say we're going to do it, but but you know does that because I don't think criteria could go in here at all but would that just be a because right now that's contained in all the plans like the urban village plan for Samish says it the urban village plan for fountain says it the downtown plan says it all these individual plans have their own rules about that would it have you guys thought that through at all or is this kind of like based on what we the feedback Steve brought up and, and this is first shot at it there's so many different circumstances. You have planned commercial, you have neighborhood commercial, you have our urban villages. Um, you have many circumstances that we couldn't tackle them all at once. This would be something where we would have to prioritize because it would be a lot of work. And so um, to say something in the comp plan, how to accomplish this, I think would be premature. We need to figure out how to accomplish it with our resources. And I think we mentioned last time that we actually did it when we updated the downtown plan. We reduced the area mm -hmm. that required ground floor commercial. So when we get those opportunities, or with the urban village plans, we're looking for where you know where ground floor commercial can work and where it can't, or where it probably won't, and, and making sure that the regulations and the zoning match up with what we think is appropriate. So we do do that and we are going to be looking at our commercial zoning regulations sort of the big picture of all of our commercial zoning regulations over the next year or so. Um, and this could be a, a component of that. Um, uh, but if you want to make a stronger policy statement, now's the time to do it if you think a stronger statement is needed. I would just like to make sure that we have some flexibility in that because I, I live near where the on Lincoln Street and those have been vacant the entire time and I think it's a real blight on the neighborhood and it's a drain on the person who owns the property. Yeah, flex space I think is probably the answer. That's an arterial I like that. that's an arterial street, you would think with and as more um, development happens in the area, the students across the street, I mean there perhaps those commercial spaces will work at some point. We're hopeful that they will but but they could go back and forth between being residential and commercial as the market drives them so, so if the city dug in like with with there, there was an absence of a discussion before and now we have a policy at least as a baseline that suggests that this is something to look at so that gives the city a good basis to move forward and then think about it and then if you were going to change the rules on anything that would come back through like a legislative process so we get to tackle things like specifics at that point. Yes. Okay. The next one is regarding um, the need for better paying jobs. 
And the housing affordability section does reference the fact that Bellingham's wages aren't keeping up with housing costs and refers the reader to the economic development chapter for additional direction. Um, in looking at the economic development chapter, there is a policy, or uh, let's see, I, in the economic development chapter, it's stated as a goal, but we could certainly pull that over to the housing chapter as a policy. And it says accommodate a broad mix of employment opportunities while actively seeking a greater proportion of living wage jobs that will benefit a broad cross section of Bellingham residents. Do you envision very much of that going on in this document? The like doubling up policies amongst chapters where they where there's, they, they I work? mean, there's a little bit of that that occurs and I think that's perfectly acceptable in a comp plan as long as you're not taking wholesale sections and yeah, <laughs> multiple policies. But if there's one that's sp specifically relevant and important, it's fine. Can you just reference it? You know, say C, um, goal ED2. Well, and we did already. It sounds like you've got some of it. Where is that in the I document? Mean, let's see. We didn't list out all of the specific policies in the economic development related chapter related to that we just said it's page four of 17 in the housing chapter there's just a short paragraph this is the see the economic development chapter for more information on this aspect of the housing affordability issue this is something I brought up <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm okay waiting till we get through the economic chapter and seeing how I feel about how that reads. I just can't remember from when we went through it a couple of years ago. And, and maybe that's part of the problem is that we have these ideas that are like important, but they may be dealt with in two months because we read them somewhere else. So I'm, I'm okay kind of just stepping back from that unless someone else has more discussion on that and just seeing how this whole thing interfaces with the economic development chapter. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you though. So step back from that one for now? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the economic development chapter, it's not, that one's not going to be um, modified as much as these other ones because it's newer. Yeah. So you can pretty much look at, <laughs> at what's on the website right now for that. And get a good that feel chapter and get for a good what's feel like. for it. Yeah. The next one is uh, stating that the chapter doesn't include enough mention of housing for the middle income segment of the population. And uh, we do feel that it, it includes quite a bit of information on this. Uh, I mean, one of the main priorities of the chapter is that the provision of housing options for all income levels be considered, and this includes middle income workers. Um, goal H2 specifically, and we have numerous policies aimed at providing incentives and offering flexibility for smaller homes and workforce housing. But once again, we can uh, pull over a policy from the economic development chapter specific to this, which states developer support programs that seek to provide an increased supply of workforce housing. So H2, let me see here, goal H2 is foster safe affordable housing for all income levels. Is there any comment on this? It sounds like we're okay leaving it as is. So that's a wrap up of all the comments that we had for the Planning Commission in particular. Then if you go to the comment tracker for the public comments. Many of them are similar to the comments that the Planning Commission had. So in a lot of cases, we just referenced the Planning Commission comment tracker. But a few that might be different, uh, one was from Greg Griffith from the State Historic Preservation Office. And he had um, a comment re regarding adaptive reuse of historic properties for public and institutional development. And that chapter you'll see has been folded into the capital facilities chapter. That's coming up soon. 
Maury Ingram with the Whatcom Community Foundation just uh, su supported the identification of health as one of the plan's key focus areas. So we, we noted that and we emphasized that the cover pages, cover memos for the chapters will include and highlight the key changes related to health and the other focus areas. So Clayton had a comment, Clayton Petrie had a comment regarding the URMRX zones and transfer of development rights. And it's noted that we assume development in the URMX zones would not be using TDRs. And because of that, we would be assuming the minimum densities in those zones rather than a mid-range or maximum density scenario. And he also had a comment regarding inclusionary zoning. And we just stated that any future program would include a, a broad public process that would go through the legislative process. Linda Twitchell with the Building Industry Association of Whatcom County submitted a letter with several concerns, and many of which are included in the Planning Commission comment tracker. One that wasn't, uh, she asked us to define context sensitive. And it is defined in page 13 of the draft land use chapter. Context sensitive design refers to development practices and roadway standards that are flexible and sensitive to community values. CSD allows design decisions to better balance economic, social, and environmental objectives. She also had a comment regarding equitable and inclusive community involvement. She said that this requires definition. And we're stating that H42 does not, is not, it's not a new policy. The public participation policies in the existing plan are primarily located in the land use chapter. And we thought it would be appropriate to include a specific public participation policy in the housing chapter. It aligns with the, the existing public participation policies as well as the updated chapter, the updated land use chapter. Are you having a hard time following? <laughs> okay, just wanna make sure. We're on page, the bottom of page three. And we're moving on to page four. Linda Barton had a, a comment regarding a specific project that's being constructed near her house and she wanted it submitted as part of the record for the, the comprehensive plan update. And we, responded to her via email that the house that she's um, mentioning in her letter has not received a final inspection and the owner's not allowed to occupy it. So staff followed up on that with a visit and a letter to that person. And then Linda Twitchell had an a, additional comment uh, regarding the, the city scarcity of buildable land and we feel like that was addressed in the planning commission tracker. And then today, Lisa Anderson submitted um, her comments on both of the chapters. And would you like us to go through those as well? Sure. There, I think there's some things like just, you know, the edits and stuff that don't necessarily have to be um, talked about. And I do think there's a couple that we've touched on a little bit. So feel free to skip over that. But I'm glad you're addressing some of it so I don't have to ask them to <laughs> right now so okay do you do you want to is there any particular ones that, that you have follow-up questions on or anything or at least are you going to go through them is that well like she said I think there's just a few that we haven't touched on yeah. already and mm -hmm. and I we can easily okay. quickly address them and they aren't included in the tracker that you received because we, we just received them today but we'll fold them into that she had a question about um, on page five of the land use chapter memo, not the plan, but the memo. Um, under the health section, number 13, it talks about neighborhood continuity and she wanted to 
be provided with an example of what that is. And that section, those are just recommendations that were provided to us by the Whatcom County Health Department for consideration of inclusion as policies, and we didn't end up including that as a policy in the plan. But what, what they're getting at with neighborhood continuity is that if someone is living in a neighborhood and they in a particular type of housing and they want to stay in that neighborhood and maybe move to a different type of housing from say an apartment to um, a small house that they could do that and so it's really getting at mixing of housing types within neighborhoods and, and we do have some policies that get at that but we didn't call it neighborhood continuity And then your next question, um, also on page five, under the sustainability section, you said that you're glad to see the development of an urban forest management plan and you wanted to see stronger language um, than consider, maybe emphasize the need for. And this specific policy will be included in the environment chapter that will come before you um, on March 17th. So you'll get to see the specific language at that time. Let's see, uh, you had a question about cluster subdivisions. Can we give you an idea of, of cluster subdivisions? Do you have an example of one? I, I don't have an example of one. The, the concept, and this is allowed under our zoning and I don't know, quite a few zoning districts, is if you have a parcel that allows, say, 10 lots and the parcel is impacted by wetlands, um, you get to transfer the density from the wetland portion to the rest of the site so that we don't necessarily lose units because of critical areas impacts that's you cluster the lots in the buildable portion of the property and we do have some examples of those subdivisions and I'll, I'll get you that information I'll get everybody that information we will when I say I mean Lisa. I was just wondering also kind of give an example of where it states um, provide other public good and I didn't know if that was an exchange for density. Say an example that I had 10 acres and I want to do a higher density, but I'm willing to put a certain amount of space into green space or park or community garden or something like that. I mean, would that be a viable example of that? Or I mean, what, how would you define an example or provide an example of provide other public good? To me, public is open to others than residents of that location, unless I'm too broad on my interpretation of public. So uh, our current clustered um, regulations uh, allow for either dedication of additional open space for additional bonus or provision of affordable housing for additional bonus um, or other means. Generally, all of them are intended as meeting a public good of some sort. And, you know, this, as we're looking at our subdivision ordinance, you know, we could look at additional criteria, how that could be satisfied, not just limited to the few that we have right now. Your next comment was regarding LU11, which talks about items that should be considered in neighborhood plans, one of which um, is readily accessible neighborhood schools. And you wanted to see that be its own policy with a stronger emphasis. Um, we suggest that you look at LU 38, which you did reference as being close to a policy that, that would work for that. And we could add walkability after infill development to say retain neighborhood schools in developed areas and locate new schools consistent with the city's commitment to the city's commitment to infill development, walkability, and compact growth. We, we'll put that in the tracker and you can discuss that if that would work for you. And then you asked for a copy of the city's annexation phasing plan and we can get a copy of that to you if others would like to can see we, it. Can you distribute that to everybody? I've, I've thought about that as well. Yes. Page four of seven in the housing chapter, policy H, H6, which is a new policy. 
as it reads now, it says consider mo modifying height limits and codes to maximize economic, economical wood frame construction. And your question is where would this be considered? And at this point, since it's sort of like what we've been talking about, we don't have a specific plan outlined for what that would look like at this point. Um, I mean, the main goal of that policy would be to maximize wood frame construction as a means of economically increasing heights under existing height limits. So it, we could possibly remove the modifying height limits part, and I don't think that would impact that policy. Yeah, my primary concern was um, just, I think you can go four stories with a stick frame, or is it five? for height? Uh, you can go taller now. Uh, down in Seattle, my understanding is they do what they consider five over two. So you can do five stories of stick frame over two stories of concrete podium. Okay. Yeah, my primary concern was um, this being implemented in an area where maybe there's not the, um, you know, where like a height regulation. I'm just thinking like along Ellis. Um, you know, if somebody builds something very tall and it overshadows their neighbor's house and it basically puts them in a sun shadow, I just think, um, I mean, it's great to maximize, but I think we have to be careful about where that gets put in. But I'm glad to hear it's within the, um, the height limitations of the zoning. And I didn't catch that as part of the statement here. So I don't know if that could be added for clarification. Because when I first read it, I thought, oh, Lord, I don't want a five-story building in New York next to me that I don't have, you know, a garden anymore. And realizing there's the height limitation definitely helps. Yeah, I, the, the intent of this policy is not to open up our, <laughs> our height limits and, and go into that, that discussion. Isn't it's the intent more like in a multifamily zone where, say, right, if, exactly. it's, if it's 50 feet now and you can actually do five over two, yes. wouldn't it make more sense to go to 60 or 70 because you could actually get there economically with wood? Yes. Like that's the idea, yeah, but not in a idea. not in a single family neighborhood, no, at all. We'll, yeah, yeah, it's not clear. We'll yeah. modify this to be a little clearer. It, it's a new concept that we're sort of hashing out, so we're happy to do that. So let's see. I think we pretty much covered all of them. Well, uh, H fifteen, you had a question about specific to reduced parking requirements and and ADUs. And as we stated, we don't know what that ADU ordinance will look like. And that reduced parking requirements in that list of chat recommendations, it's not tied to ADUs. It would be part of a broader parking reform. That would once again be a big process <laughs> with lots of public input. So I think we've got them all. Unless Actually, the last one, which oh. is one that I um, was important to me. Um, so the page oh, oh. 9 of 7 yep. policy H-48, yep. um, basically the, it's maintain an inventory of interim housing for target population. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that expanded, that I'd like to see uh, the city work towards creating new or expand and maintain. Um, the interim housing, because from what I understand, when I was working with um, social services regarding uh, Samish Way, is one of the biggest problems they have is we don't have enough interim housing. And so that's why they're using the hotels for people to stay three to six months until they can get them into affordable housing. So I'd like to see something stronger that maybe encourages the city to use some of the, the funding um, that we have for the creating low-income housing to be dedicated. I know that's a different policy, but if we could write something that we can refer back to, that would encourage that um, building more of that type of housing supply because it's very much needed. Do you, did you feel like those other policies on that page didn't, didn't capture that? Since um, this one specifically mentioned interim yeah. housing itself, because the other housing are different types, but interim is something very specific. Um, it's a short-term emergency housing. Yeah. So since it was specifically mentioned as a policy, I'd like to see 
okay. create new, maintain, okay. expand, something along that crafted okay. other than just, you know, maintaining it, we need to expand it. Right, okay, we can do that. Okay, thank you. And to kind of cover, cover everything. So um, we've gone through the tracker and some individual comments. I think if anyone else has any other comments that are in general or questions at this time, we could ask them as staff. Um, if there's any other specific topics within the two documents um, that we want to get get anything out for staff to consider. Um, again, we're going to have an opportunity to come back to this with some actual revised language in the document, but now is a good opportunity. Steve? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question and specifically not related to the two items tonight, but it seems like we continually get written information at the last minute, no fault of staff, but it comes in from the public that they want us to consider different items. And, and this one from Mr. Th Peter Thiessen, I mean, and it's quite extensive. There's a lot of information in it. Is, is there a way that we can put in the meeting notices that you've got to get the information to us early so we can read it prior to these meetings? I'm sure there's very few, if anybody, had the opportunity to go through this. And there's some great tables, there's some great information. And I think we ought to say, maybe it's two days prior to the meeting, not cutting it off, but please get it into us so we can relay it to the commission for review prior to our Thursday meeting. I, is there a way to get, come up with something like that? I, I just hate to see somebody take all the time and in putting into something like this, and it basically probably nobody really had a chance to, to look at it. Well, we do post all the comments on the comp plan update webpage um, with all the other information. And this letter, I, yeah, I did want to mention that we did receive this letter from the United Way of Whatcom County regarding their new ALICE report, which stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. And there's a lot of good data in there, as you stated. And they included just a summary of the larger report for you, which is still, yeah, <laughs> a few pages. But um, we'll, we'll add this to the comment tracker. We'll summarize it, and then we'll respond to it. Okay. But as far as getting people to submit it earlier, I mean. I know maybe <laughs> if it's not two, here before two days prior to the meeting, more likely than not, it will not be disseminated or time to disseminate before the meeting. I just hate to get these things the day of the meeting. I, I, and, I, and it's not the staff's fault. It's just late submissions. I share that frustration because uh, it's harder to take in good comment and, and a lot of the comment we receive at the last minute is good comment and a lot of the ideas that we generate I think do derive from good public comment. Um, I don't think we can tell people they can't submit comments at any point they want but all we can do and we've done this before I think throughout the, at least the time I've spent on the Planning Commission as chair and not as chair is remind people the sooner you get us information, the more time we have to assimilate it. When you walk in and hand us a piece of paper at the meeting, it's very hard for us to assimilate that information. So all we can do is, uh, maybe maybe there's a way to put a notice on the public thing that says, the sooner you get it to us. I don't think we should be telling people you have to get it to us by 2 p.m. on a certain day to be considered. I don't think that's fair to the public. But well, I just, there's gotta be something out there. Please submit as early as possible. Yeah. Reminding That's people hard. that over and over again is the best thing we can do because we want to be able to take your comment into consideration during our deliberations. Heather, you've got your finger up as if you have an idea. Yeah, so every notice that we send out has language. Every notice that we send out has language that says if you want this to go to the Planning Commission in their packet, here's the deadline. Um, that's, that's, and that's very specific. Yeah, and, and I, mean, I, it's, I there, it, it's an actual I didn't deadline. See that. I, no, that that's good. Okay, so Still always going to get stuff. At yeah, the I just encourage that. people to I read the that. notice thoroughly. I feel badly yeah. when I get this much information. And the good thing is we have time with this, so we can always bring this back. Jeff. 
I agree, but my counterpoint is um, I really actually do appreciate Rick's comment. It's, it's easier for me to track things and um, sort through things if I've written comment. And if somebody has a really busy life and a busy schedule and they can't get something through that early, you know, if it has to come the day of the meeting, that's I'd rather have it than not have it. Better than not. So, yeah. you know, I have the same inclination, you know, earlier is better, but, but I like written comment. It's great. And whenever it comes, that's great too. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. That's a bit of an aside. I did. Ha I had one question about the land use chapter uh, that came up based on a comment Clayton made. It, Clayton made a comment during the public co public comment that made it sound like the county council. And we got your email, Greg. So appreciate that because you know we'd all asked about what was going on with that. And and but he made a comment that that indicated that the the county council did not include the Kitech area in a UG reserve is that accurate they actually yeah they actually didn't discuss the reserves at all at all so they so just were they could, just quiet yeah, on that it could still happen but um, the population number that they are recommending preliminarily can be accommodated with our existing boundaries they didn't they didn't say anything about um, the U Street Reserve or the Kitek Reserve so possibility the, of a reserve. those reserves are in their or the U Street Reserve is in their comp plan now as yes. it is in ours so in theory, if they just move forward as is, don't talk about it, U Street would stay in, Kitech wouldn't be in. We have a policy on page 16, LU46, that says retain the designation of the South U Street properties UGA, UGA Reserve Area and add the South Kitech property. So what happens That's if they- That's our recommendation. Yeah, so if they choose not to do that, do we strike that from our, our policy document? We certainly could, although- um, I'm not suggesting that we should necessarily, I'm just asking if we yeah, need to. I mean, we, we could, but if our recommendation remains that that property should be in a reserve, then we can leave it in We there. can leave it in if yeah. we all, if the city thinks it's still an appropriate thing to do so that future people looking back and say this is what the city thought about this issue. Okay, I just wanted clarity on that if we, if it would be appropriate or not to either take it out or leave it in. It sounds like we could do either. Okay. Anybody else with specific questions, comments on the land use housing chapter? Okay. Well, thank you, staff. These, all three of these meetings, I think, have been really good. We've had really good discussion amongst the group about all these issues, and, and I appreciate you guys responding with the tracker, with some suggestions for language. And again, beating this dead horse, reminding everybody this is not our last bite at the apple. So if you are looking through this and you think of language that you want to propose, I think you should bring it forward to the count, the council, the commission um, at one of our meetings or via written comment or, or, you know, so we have an opportunity to look at that um, and, and continue to do that throughout these chapters. So with that, we will uh, end the work session. And we have no old or new business on our schedule. Is there anything, Greg, that you want to kind of clue us into or talk about? Yeah, I wanted to uh, give you a heads up. Um, it was interesting. We were talking about transitional housing earlier. Uh, Lydia Place has applied for a comp plan amendment and rezone to expand their current facility on uh, Gladstone Street in the Puget neighborhood. Uh, that will be coming to you. Um, we're going to have to try and fit that into all of the other work that we're doing, but that's going to be coming to you probably in April, that request. Um, so I wanted to just to give you a heads up. It's a legislative matter, so you don't have to worry about not talking to folks about it. Um, they um, need to expand that facility, and they've got a great site. They've got a large site. It's buffered from other properties. If you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't know it was there. Um, and it will address a real need in the community. Um, and we're doing it as quickly as we can. That's sort of why we're shoehorning it into your review of the comp plan. We're going to get that thing reviewed as soon as possible and get it approved as soon as possible. Um, the change that they're seeking to add some capacity to the site uh, will allow them to access funding um, both from the city and other sources, um, but they need that approval from the city before they can get that funding. So there is uh, some urgency to it, and it will be coming to you this spring. And that's not one of these docketed rezones? It, it, 
it's not docketed yet. What we're going to do, I believe, is ask the city council to just to docket it. They have the ability to docket something uh, at any time during the year. So rather than taking an extra month or two and take it through the full docketing process, we're just going to go directly to council and ask them to docket it. If that occurs, then that's when it comes back to you for a hearing on the merits. Shortens the timeline a little bit is, sure. is what it does. Okay, but thank doesn't, you. It doesn't shorten the actual review process. So we'll get a full hearing before you on the merits, and then your recommendation will go to council, and they'll have a full hearing on the merits as well. So that's something that we can actually do. Rather than writing policy language, we can actually review a proposal to get some additional housing on the ground in, sh in short order um, with city helping with funding. Um, so we're pretty excited about bringing that to you. And if we had that policy addition that Lisa's talking about, it would give us one more thing to back that decision up if we make a decision on that. Yeah. yeah. Phyllis, do you see oh, I was going to ask, is that the April 14th suggested meeting? Is yes. Got it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we've talked about scheduling a special meeting for it because we didn't want to take away from your time reviewing the comp plan. Um, but um, if you're available on April 14th, at least preliminarily, that's what we're thinking will be your hearing date. Okay. And our next meeting is on, from my notes, the discussion of the transportation and capital facilities chapters. So it'll be both together? It'll be both. We'll see how far we get, but okay. yeah, it'll be both. Uh, and that's March 3rd. And I will be absent for that meeting, just to notice to everybody. So Garrett will be, and I've no notified Garrett, so he'll be prepared to, to take over for that meeting. I'll get caught up when I get back. All right, anything else? No? Nope. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for all the public comment and listening, and thanks, commissioners. We'll see you in a few weeks.